Hello and welcome to chapter 9. This is going to be problem 4. And I like problem 4 because it allows me to talk about several things. The first thing it lets me talk about is the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, and their relationship to the research hypothesis. Second thing it lets me talk about is the type 1 and type 2 errors. There's a lot of confusion on that. Hopefully this will fix that confusion. Three, it help, allows me to talk to you about how to calculate the test statistic for the T test. And finally, it allows me to show you how to look up the critical value from a T table. And then we'll compare the test statistic that you calculated in C with the critical value that you calculated in D. And we'll see how those two relate and how they relate to your final conclusion about the null hypothesis. And here we are, problem number four. Let's go ahead and scroll this a little bit. The problem itself isn't that interesting. I'm given a random sample of seven Ohio banks, and specifically the bad debt ratio for those seven banks. I've got them over here in Excel. We might need that in the future. If I didn't want to type those seven values in, I could have clicked here to download the data file, and that would have been just as easy. So A1. The banking officials claim that the mean bad debt ratio for all Midwestern banks is 3.5%, and that the mean bad debt ratio for Ohio banks is higher. So this is the research hypothesis. The research hypothesis is always stated in the problem, either the problem given to you in the book, or the problem given to you by your boss, or the problem given to you by your brain. That's the research hypothesis. That is the hypothesis that you as a scientist care about. You as a statistician have to take that research hypothesis and make it into a null hypothesis and an alternative hypothesis. That research hypothesis will always be either the null hypothesis or the alternative. How do we know which? You look for the equals. If there is an equals part in the research hypothesis, then that's going to make the research hypothesis and the null hypothesis the same. If there is no equals part, then the research hypothesis and the alternative will be the same. So let's read through that research hypothesis again. Banking officials claim that the mean bad debt ratio for all Midwestern banks is 3.5%, and that the mean bad debt ratio for Ohio banks is higher. Therefore, the research hypothesis is that mu, the mean, for Ohio is greater than, it's higher than, it's greater than 3.5%. Because there's no equals in greater than, the research hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are going to be exactly the same. So we can put 3.5 in here for the alternative, because the alternative is mu is greater than 3.5%. The mean for all Ohio banks is higher than 3.5%. So this is an example where the research hypothesis and the alternative hypothesis are the same. They're not always the same, it's just that in this example they are. Now that we have the alternative, we can easily create the null hypothesis. The alternative and the null are opposites of each other. They're logical opposites. So if the alternative is greater than, the null is going to be less than or equal to 3.5%. If the alternative were less than, then the null would be greater than or equal to. If the alternative were not equal to, well, the opposite of not equal to would be equal to. So again, the research hypothesis is given to you by the problem, by your boss, by your brain. And that research hypothesis will either be the null or the alternative, depending on whether or not there's an equals part in the research hypothesis. That is, depending on if the research hypothesis says greater than or equal to, less than or equal to, or equal to. If it says any of those three, then the research hypothesis and the null hypothesis will be the same. If the research hypothesis is greater than, less than, or not equal to, 
then the research and the alternative will be the same. There, that's it's an important thing to realize that the research hypothesis is what we as scientists care about, but we as statisticians have to look at the alternative and the null hypothesis. The second part of this, which is A2, is we're going to discuss the meanings of a type 1 error and a type 2 error in this situation. Now here's a nice little graphic of the difference between a type 1 error and a type 2 error. Both of the error types has to do with you doing something wrong. Your conclusion about the null hypothesis is wrong. In a type 1, you wrongly reject a true null hypothesis. That is, in a type 1 error, the null hypothesis is true, but you still reject it. Type 2 error is that you wrongly fail to reject the null hypothesis. That is, the null hypothesis is wrong, but you fail to reject it. Type 1 is going to be related to alpha. Type 2 is going to be related to something called power. These are the two error types. They have to do with your conclusion related to the status of the null hypothesis and whether or not that conclusion was correct. So again, type 1, null hypothesis is true, you reject it. Type 2, the null hypothesis is false, you fail to reject it. So let's see what that actually looks like in this context. So type 1, conclude that the mean bad debt ratio is, well let's refer to our slide, type 1 is you wrongly reject the null hypothesis. In other words, the null hypothesis is true but you reject it. So, which of these should we conclude? Remember, again, I'll bring this up. Type 1, null hypothesis is true, but you reject it. The null hypothesis is true, but you reject it. When did you reject it? You reject it when you conclude that the alternative is true. Think about that for a moment. Go ahead and pause, rewind over this little part, and then come back to it. And now we'll talk about type 2. Type 2, again from our slide, you wrongly fail to reject the null hypothesis. That is, the null hypothesis is false, but you conclude that it's true. It's false, but you concluded that the null hypothesis was true. You concluded, in this case, mu was indeed less than or equal to 3.5%, when in fact it really wasn't. So let's pop this up one more time. Type 1, you wrongly reject the null hypothesis. That is, H0 is true, you conclude that it's not. Type 2, you wrongly fail to reject the null hypothesis. In other words, the null hypothesis is wrong, but you conclude that it's not wrong. Two types of error are very important because making mistakes is always important. Well, it's important to avoid. So that's A2. All right, so we've taken care of the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, and the relationship to the research hypothesis. Second, we've taken care of discussing the difference between a type 1 error and a type 2 error. Now we're going to calculate the test statistic, this t-test statistic, the number that's going to go in here. Remember, we've got to round it to three decimal places. Well, here's the formula for the test statistic, for the t-test, or the t-test statistic. This t, the t that we're going to calculate, is equal to the mean from the sample minus the hypothesized mean divided by, and this denominator is actually called the standard error, it's the standard deviation of the sample divided by the square root of the sample size. x bar minus mu naught divided by s over root n. Now, this 3.5 percent is indeed going to be our mu naught. n is the sample size, n is 7 x bar is just the sample mean. Well, we got to figure out what the sample mean here is. Highlight those and the mean, yeah, it's 
is 6. Or we can just do the mean. This is equal to average. That's going to be A2 through A8. It would be nice if I could actually type. There we go, 6. And we also need the standard deviation of the sample. And the formula for that in Excel is stdev dot s. And the dot s makes it of the sample. If you had done stdev dot p, that would be the standard deviation of the population. And this is also going to be from A2 through A8. So the mean of the sample is 6. The standard deviation of the sample is 0.57735. Now, why did we need that? And here's the test statistic. There's x bar. Mu naught again was 3.5. Now we've calculated s, and n is just the sample size. So we can calculate the test statistic now. Let's go ahead and break this up into two parts. The numerator, this is just going to be equal to x bar, which is the sample mean, minus our hypothesized mean, which is 3.5. The denominator, well, that's just going to be the sample, uh, the sample, that's not what we want. There we go. The sample standard deviation divided by the sample size, the square root of the sample size. That's going to equal the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. And again, the sample size is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And so the actual test statistic is just going to equal that numerator divided by the denominator. 11.5. Three decimal places, so that would be 11.456. And there we go. That's calculating the test statistic, the t test test statistic. And we're almost done. All we have to do now is calculate the critical value, then interpret the results. Critical values come from the t table. This is t sub 0 0.01. That 0 0.01 refers to the probability or the alpha level for committing a type 1 error. Ooh, we talked about type 1 errors up here. So we want a t of 0 0.01. So let's go to the t table. t table looks something like this. This will be inside the back cover, and then one page back in your textbook. Notice that the t-table looks a bit different from the z-table. The t-table along the left side, we have something called df, or degrees of freedom. And along the top, we've got the probabilities, which means in the interior of the t-table, we've got the critical values. So the probability is 0 0.01. 0 0.01, so we're going to pay attention to just this column the 0 0.01 column. We need the degrees of freedom. Well, for a one sample t-test, the number of degrees of freedom is always n minus 1. n here is 7. 7 minus 1 is 6. So we're going to use degrees of freedom equals 6. Along this row, remember the column was t of 0 0.01. So the critical value is at 3.143. Boom. Now the interpretation. 3.143 is the critical value. It's a critical value corresponding to that 0 0.01. What does that mean? Well, let's bring in the t distribution. Let's go ahead and pull back a little bit. There's the t-distribution with 6 degrees of freedom. This right here is the critical value we just looked up, the 3.143. It corresponds to a probability or an alpha of 0 0.01. How do I know that? That's what the 0 0.01 indicates. That 0 0.01 also indicates 
that this area to the right of the critical value is 0 0.01. Now if we look carefully, I've got that in red. I'm going to zoom in quite a bit. If we can see the red a little bit better, not too much better. But this area to the right of this critical value is 0 0.01. And that's what makes this the 0 0.01 critical value. Now let's stop and think for a second what the p-value actually means. The p-value is the probability. Well, probability is just an area. It's the probability of observing data this extreme or more so. Well, it's the probability of observing data this extreme or more so given the null hypothesis is true. So because our alternative hypothesis is greater than, we're going to define this extreme or more so as being greater than what we observe. What did we observe? We observed the 11.456. We observed, well, I don't go all the way out to 11.456, but we can imagine it's far, far here to the left, to the, to the right. Sorry, I have left-right issues. Well, if the area to the right of the critical value is 0 0.01, then the area to the right of what we observe is going to be much less than that 0 0.01. Stop and think about that for a moment. If the area to the right of the critical value is 0 0.01, since we observed something way out here, the area to the right of what we observe is going to be less than that 0 0.01. Much less than that 0 0.01. Since what we observed, t, is greater than, what we observed t is greater than our t of 0, 1, we're going to reject our null hypothesis. Since our critical value is to the left of our observed test statistic, we reject the null hypothesis. Now note that this conclusion is based on two things. The first thing that's based on is our alternative hypothesis. If the alternative hypothesis were less than, then we wouldn't be rejecting the null hypothesis. But it's greater than, so we're defining everything greater than what we observe as being the p-value. And we always reject the null hypothesis when the p-value is too small. So we reject the null hypothesis. The p-value is too small, or we can think of it as the test statistic is too great. And that's it. So we've done four things, four rather important things. One, we talked about the relationship between the research hypothesis and the null and the alternative hypothesis. Two, we talked about the two types of errors. It's important as we move forward. Three, we determined how to calculate that t test statistic. Four, we looked at determining or looking up or calculating or however you want to call it, the critical value. And then five, we looked at the relationship between the test statistic, what we observe, and the critical value to get an estimate for the p-value, and then how that relates to whether we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis. I hope this was rather helpful. Go back over it a couple times. There's some nice slides in there that you should look at. And take care of yourselves. I'll be here for you.